flying in directly from Michigan just for this event and right after this flying back home so that he can be with his family for Easter is none other than the designer, a vice president of Ford Motor Company and designer of the Fox Body Mustang, Jack Telnack. Folks, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is because Jack did something different than most of the guys that design Mustangs. He took Mustang in an all new direction and he's going to share with us this morning that story of how he took the, the reins at Ford Design and made Mustang different and changed really the, the, the path of Mustang. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Jack Telnack. to uh, talk about one of my favorite products. Uh, John, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think it was a bit brief, but uh, <laughs> only, only do it. Thank you. I guess I should tell you a little bit about my qualifications, too. In the first place, why, why should uh, a guy like me have an opportunity to design the iconic, uh, an iconic car like a Mustang? Well, I was born in the Ford Hospital in Detroit. <laughs> My father was with a company, the Ford Motor Company, for 38 years. I attended college on a Ford scholarship, and then Ford uh, hired me right out of college and uh, brought me in to design the first, uh, uh, my first job. And I think I couldn't draw a Chevy if I tried, so that really, <laughs> really cemented the whole thing. But I, um, before getting into the 79 Mustang, I'd just give you, like to give you a little bit of uh, how I started uh, in the Mustang program. I actually had an opportunity as a 25-year-old designer to uh, work on the um, first Mustang. That was Joe Horace's project. Joe Horace was the executive of the Ford studio at the time. And I worked with Joe and Gail Holderman, who's here, who you all know. And I actually had an opportunity to um, do uh, some of the sketches let me see if I can get these up here. Again, this is the 79 Mustang, the final, uh, the final model of the 79 Mustang. But these are a couple of the sketches that I did. I don't know if Gail remembers these or not. I think he, he uh, may or may not have used some of the uh, ideas here, but uh, this was the sketches for the first Fastback Mustang. These were done in 1962, if you check the date. And if you look at the rear end of uh, the sketch up there, you'll notice that there's a slight kick up in the deck. And that actually was not on the first Mustang Fastback, uh, but it did uh, finally make its way to the 68 Fastback, has a little kick up. But there's something even a little bit more unique about that sketch, and that is the lettering. I don't know if anybody can read the lettering underneath that kick up on the rear end, and it says Cougar, you're right. And I'm, I'm sure most of you know now, after hearing some of these presentations, that Cougar was the code name for the car until they finally decided on Mustang. They went through quite a few gyrations uh, before they decided on the Mustang name. And of course, there was a lot of discussion on the Mustang itself and what direction should it go to the right or to the left. And I'm sure that you've heard some of those stories. <laughs> but they finally sell that. And by the way, uh, Gail and I were just talking about the uh, designer and the modeler who actually designed the horse. And I'm not sure if you know this or not, but his, his name was Charles Karustis, and he was actually a Hungarian count, and he was an equestrian in the Hungarian army with the last division in the Hungarian army that actually rode horses in the Second World War. I mean, this guy really knew horses, and I just thought that was a little bit of history that you should know about uh, of the Mustang itself, and he did a great job on designing that. And of course, here is the first Mustang, uh, which uh, I have the pleasure to work on. And I actually have had the honor and the privilege of designing the wheel cover for this car. So that was my one big contribution to the first Mustang. And I got to tell you, they must have been good because a lot of them were stolen. 
Yeah. <laughs> I went out to Jamaica once a year just to visit my hubcaps. <laughs> but anyway, we want to talk about the 79, so uh, you may recall that the motoring press, uh, when the car was introduced, the motoring press described this car as being very European. I don't know if you thought it was European back in 79 or not, but a lot of people did. And there was a very good reason for that, so I'd like to just bring you up to date on what happened, why that had some kind of a European influence on it. Uh, the, uh, I, I happen to be based, I was a VP of design with Ford of Europe from 1972 to 1976. And we were designing a number of European products in those days uh, that had to meet European fuel regulations because fuel uh, was very expensive. This is a picture of me in the studio in Ford of Germany. We're working on cars, a clean model there. And uh, we were um, told to do, do something to improve the fuel economy of these cars. Well, the only thing we could do in design, since I don't do the powertrains or engines, we leave that up to Neil and his engineers, uh, we felt we made a significant contribution to this car, uh, to these European cars, I should say, uh, through the use of aerodynamics. And as you know, fuel was really expensive. It was expensive in this country, but it was much more expensive in Europe. So we, we did a lot of the design work for our European cars in the wind tunnel to improve the aerodynamic flow of the cars. And it was our only opportunity, and I think a very important opportunity, for design to actually contribute to the uh, fuel economy of the car. And this all was done in the wind tunnel. Needless to say, this had a lot to do with the shape and form and the contours of the vehicle. But it did give the cars, obviously, a very functional European look. So this was already going on in my head before we started on the Mustang. And uh, just, I'll show you a couple of the cars that we did in Europe. This was a Ford European Granada, and you notice how arrow-looking that car was. A very soft front end, very soft entrance, and a slant back front end on that. And this was the uh, uh, Escort, the Rally Escort. And then, of course, one of the really uh, popular cars that we did over in Europe at that time was, were the Capris. And these, this was the, the racing Capris and the uh, John Player Special, the JPS Capri. And of course, these cars had very low front ends, sloping hoods, and in some cases, slant back front ends. Now, although uh, I was directed by my uh, boss, the vice president of design at the time, Gene Bordenay in Dearborn, never to do a sloping hood and a slant back front end. I mean, that was really taboo. And he said, don't do it because Henry Ford, Henry Ford II, wants vertical front ends. You know, they must stand up. He doesn't want any of this slope back stuff. However, the market was moving that direction in Europe. And I believe that uh, to be competitive, it was imperative for us to get on the design trend curve, get on the upside of the design trend curve. So I took the risk of presenting these uh, uh, slope back and arrow looking front ends to Henry Ford II when he was over in Europe on a number of his trips. And it was fairly risky to do that, but I, I felt that I had to be up front with Mr. Ford and let him know that, uh, hey, the market is moving this way. And Henry really did, i got to tell you, aside from what my boss told me, this, this was a little bit shaky, but Henry really did buy into this idea. It took him a few visits to understand what we were doing and what the importance of aerodynamics were when we were designing these cars. But he bought into it and supported us 100%. I should add, that Bob Lutz was also in Ford of Europe at the time. You know, Bob is with many different companies, automobile companies, and uh, he was very supportive of this and uh, helped us uh, uh, to uh, get the arrow look through. We also, at that time, reintroduced the Ford Oval that you see in the uh, upper left-hand corner on the front end of the car. And that Ford Oval was never on any of our Ford products since the 30s. So this was the first time we said, look, it's one of the, one of the most popular and best-known icons in the industry. I mean, Coca-Cola is popular, IBM, and a few of those icons. But the Ford Oval is well-known all over the world. Why not use it? And again, uh, we convinced Mr. Ford that this was the place to do it. We started it there, 
and then eventually we brought it onto our U.S. cars. In 1976, um, Henry Ford told me, or directed me, to return to the United States. He got me out of Europe and uh, told me to come back to Dearborn and begin the new uh, 1979 Mustang program. Now, some of it was already started in our different studios, but uh, uh, I, I learned about this while I was in Europe, still in Europe, in 76. Uh, so I began to actually start thinking and designing the car uh, in Europe. At least I was designing it mentally. I was already in this aero uh, functional design phase. When I returned to the US, That's supposed to be me designing over in Europe, thinking mentally about the car. When I returned to the US, I was given the opportunity to create a totally new uh, 79 Mustang studio. So I really uh, uh, had, the, had the opportunity to select the designers to develop the 79 Mustang. Now, I can't take credit for designing the 79 Mustang, but I will take credit for selecting the right team, the right designers such as Bob Zokas, Fritz Mayhew, Toshi Saito, Manfred Lampe, Mark Kelly, and most of these guys had experience, especially Manfred Lampe, in the European studio. So they, they had no problem adapting to this new uh, arrow or uh, uh, arrow look with the slant back front end. Now when I set up this studio in Dearborn uh, with the new team, uh, I introduced uh, the same design process that I was using in Europe which I think better utilized the talent that we had at that time. And I refer to this process, the design process with the designers, as one of directed autonomy. That means give the designers the uh, basic program parameters, the design brief, and then get the hell out of the way and unleash the talent of these creative guys. An example of that is, I've always used, is do not ask a designer to build a bridge. Ask them to show you the best way to cross a river. But let them be creative. Now the 79 Mustang design brief, the directive that we gave them, was very simple and direct. First, we wanted a two plus two notchback and a hatchback. It had to be based on the Fox platform we wanted a, the typical long hood, short deck that a Mustang has always had. It had to be performance looking and sporty and, and aero. We introduced the aero thing. And we wanted to meet the aero criteria that we set out for them. It needed what we called strong down the road graphics. We wanted you to recognize this car as a Mustang from a distance. We wanted the wheels at the extremities of the car. We wanted a great stance and one of the wheels, uh, a tight relationship of the wheels to sheet metal. The other directive, the other directive is we wanted a complete and total departure from the 1978 Mustang II, uh, which was the ultimate pony car. Now, by the way, the designers who designed that car said, uh, if you're over 30, you won't understand it. I was over 30, so I guess I never did understand it. But in all fairness to the Mustang II, it was built on a Pinto platform and developed in response to the infamous fuel crisis that we had in the 70s, which impacted all muscle cars at that time, so we weren't on our own. However, I think it's important to mention that the car sold surprisingly well at that time. So don't undersell it. I know uh, some of you may not be too excited about that particular car, but it, it saved us, and it saved the Mustang name, and we were able to continue on with the, with the brand. Another of the design parameters uh, was the Mustang must have strong down-the-road graphics, or strong Mustang cues. Now, I don't believe, really, that the uh, uh, that the other one really had that. I'll just go back to that for a second. I've always said that this car, uh, again, bear in mind, it was built on a Pinto platform. And I've always felt that the sections were a little too full, full. I felt that it had too much overhang. And I don't mean front and rear overhang. I mean lateral overhang. The wheels were tucked under too much. You know, the body was overhanging the wheel. It just did not have a great stance. 
I had a pretty lousy stance, let's be honest. But it, again, it worked and it sold, so thank God for that. But we wanted to have more of the real Mustang DNA. We said we have to re you know, revive this car, resurrect it, put it back where it's supposed to be. Now one of the major challenges of the program was to derive this sporty looking Mustang off the Fox platform. And you all know what the Fox platform was, it was the Ford Fairmont. Talk about a challenge. Now we established the uh, package hard points and the dimensions of the car with engineering. That's uh, the overall length, the width, the height, the wheelbase, the engine compartment, the tread. And one of the most important dimensions that I, I consider in a car, and that's the cowl point, where the windshield intersects the hood. That really sets up uh, the, the basics of the car. But we were locked into the cowl point on this Fairmont uh, package, and uh, we had to really work around it. Now, my dev uh, uh, design philosophy has always been, give me a, a low cowl, and I'll give you a hot car. Now, the Fairmont was anything but low. So to achieve what we wanted, to achieve an arrow look with this package, and to, sleeve, uh, to achieve the sloping hood, it was necessary to raise the cowl point. Now that really sounds sacrilegious. But we had to, if you'll notice, the, uh, the blue line there is the Fairmont. You can see it's a very boxy looking car. So we actually took um, five inches out of the wheelbase. You can see the rear wheel has moved forward. And we reduced the overall length by almost 15 inches. We took, we took uh, overhang off the front and the rear of the car. And then we lowered the car two inches. Two inches doesn't sound like a much, but that's pretty dramatic when you're talking about a car like this. And that did give us a decent interior package as a two plus two type car. As I said, my philosophy has always been go for a low cowl. Well, in this case, to achieve the arrow front end and a sloping, uh, sloping hood, we actually had to raise the cowl. Now remember, I can't come down. When you design, when you develop a package of a car, now, the cowl is one of the most important hard points. I mean, that's set up by the engine location, sight lines for the driver and passengers, etc. And to lower it is very, very expensive. You may as well rip up the whole platform. So we couldn't lower it. But I, we did raise it to get the sloping hood. You can see with the red line on there how the cowl, right where the windshield intersects the hood, the cowl came up. And then we got, you can see the red line as it followed it forward, it does slope and gives us more of this arrow look. I gotta tell you, our engineers thought I was nuts when I asked or demanded a lower, because uh, I always demand a lower cowl. They thought I was nuts when I said, let's raise this cowl. I think some of them are still coming out of rehab after the discussions we've had. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, we were developing the 79 Capri concurrently while we were doing the 79 Mustang. And because the cars did have a uh, a, a body central that was common to both cars, but we wanted maximum differential between the two cars, and we had to get it that way. Now, if we use, we use the old system that we've been using there for years, it would have been necessary to develop the cars in separate studios. And this is the way the industry has been doing it for years. GM did it that way, Chrysler did it that way. If you had a Dodge or a Puna, they were done in separate studios. If you had a Ford or a Mercury, they were done in separate studios. But in this case, I said no, Let's keep the cars in the same studio in Bridges, uh, where we did the clay models, and have them side by side with the designers understanding both designs and understanding the development that was going on between the two cars, and then make sure that they got the differential, maximum differential between the, the Capri and the Mustang. And the process worked. Everybody knew what was going on in both sides, of the, in the Murphy side and the Ford side, and the theory uh, I think really blew it out, blew everything out of the water that by having these cars done side by side, side by side to ensure their distinctiveness. When we began the design process, uh, we used these uh, ideation sketches. We went through a whole series of these uh, for the Mustang, and we did it for the Cougar, or, sorry, the Capri also. And then we were to select these themes, and from these sketches, these design sketches, we developed a full side full-size side-view black tape drawings. And uh, however, this is uh, where we uh, really departed uh, from the traditional top-down type management decision on this, and I'll explain that. Uh, I recall uh, walking into the studio, looking at these sketches with our designers, 
And the first day I walked in, the designers just stood back, and uh, they were accustomed to uh, the chief walking in and selecting the sketches and letting the boss make the final selection. And at that point, I said, no, uh, I will not pick the sketch. I want each of you to tell me uh, which designs you believe in, and I want you to be confident and excited about your designs, and then you propose, you make these proposals and sell the ideas to the team. Well, I was a, it was a, a total departure from the old design culture. So I told them, I said, look, let me know when you're prepared to stand up for the designs you believe in, and then I'll return and listen to your recommendations. And I walked out of the meeting and slammed the door. <laughs> there was supposed to be a door slot there and didn't have it. Uh, needless to say, I got a lot of blank stares from the, from a whole group. However, at the uh, next meeting, uh, we had a very exciting and productive meeting, and we had quick, quickly agreed on several designs and immediately took them into full-size tape drawings, as you can see here. When I say tape drawings, we just used uh, uh, photographic black tape and stretch it out in, in, on paper. And then we can move the lines very easily on paper. You can see there are quite a few variations that we're looking at here that are done in black tape. But uh, they're very effective. And then once you have these types of drawings, and these are done according to the dimensions that we agreed upon for overall height, overall length, overall width, and of course that magic uh, uh, point, the color point. And you'll see quite a few uh, variations on that. These are just some more of the tape drawings that were done during the program. And these, these particular ones were done in, uh, mainly in the Mustang studio. Well, then we went on to a full-size full clay model. And this is a picture of the 79 Mustang being developed in clay. You can see that the, from the door forward we have a, a paint on the car that's called Dynock. It's a plastic film that's applied to the clay that's painted. <coughs> and it actually makes it look like a real car. I mean, it's, it's uh, surprising how realistic these things are. Sometimes these clay models are so realistic that management would walk up to them and grab onto the door handle and pull it off and not realize that it's fake. <laughs> there wasn't much that was real in those studios, including some of the designers, but that's another story. <laughs> now the Mustang Studio then uh, model was market research with a number of different models that were done in different studios. Now, for example, the one up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, I think was from the advanced studio, and you can see it's still a very boxy design. It's a high front end. They didn't uh, play around with the cowl line at all. And, uh, and the one down in the lower right-hand corner is from our Ghia studio in Turin, Italy. So we really had some competition going with the company, which was fairly typical for most design programs. Here are a few more models, again, uh, uh, some with the rake C-pillar on them, uh, but we're starting to get more into the sloping hood, especially up in the, uh, the left-hand uh, left picture there, you can see with the slanted uh, C-pillar. And uh, the one way up in the upper left-hand corner is very sedan-y, that one obviously didn't make it, but we were trying every variation that uh, the designers could think of at that point. But the one in the lower left-hand corner, you can see, is starting to get into that more aero look. We went through quite a few full-size clay models, and uh, some of these, uh, most of these pictures were taken right in our courtyard outside. By the way, by the way, the best way to review these cars is to you can do them inside the building in a bridge, in a dimensional bridge. But you have to take them outside in the sunlight on a turntable, spin them around, and look at them to see if you really like the car. I took it one step beyond that. I always assisted to take the cars over to our test track, which was just across the street from our design center, put the clay model, fully finished as you see here, on the test track with competitive cars around it, and then get in a car and drive around it and see what it looks like, really see what it looks like on the road. Because you're, otherwise you're going to be surprised if you just look at it inside a building and then get it on the road and uh, wonder what happened. It takes on a whole different attitude once you get it on the road. Yeah, let's see here. We uh, market researched these models, and this, uh, by the way, is the final model that was done, the final clay model that was done in the Mustang studio, uh, and then it was approved by Mr. Ford, but we researched these models, and I, I've got to tell you, I've always felt that market research was somewhat of a black art. Our research people never appreciated me saying that, but um, 
It was like looking in a rear view mirror. We wanted to go into the future and you really find it. It's, it's very difficult to invite, a, say, 50 respondents in to review a, an all new car uh, without having any real background in design. Uh, I mean, it, it took a lot of uh, interpretation by our market research people to come up with really useful answers. So although, although they were going through a lot of research on these cars, we stuck to this original design and it hardly changed from the, the initial sketch through the clay model. And by the way, that is a clay model with what we call a see-through greenhouse. It looks like the real car when it's sitting there. But the final design uh, did hold very closely to the original sketch theme and through the full-size tape and through the clay modeling. And it was approved by Henry Ford. So I think it was that point that uh, Henry Ford really bought into the uh, more functional aerodynamic look. And it really was the beginning of the aerodynamic look, not only in Ford, but believe it or not, throughout the industry, because nobody in town, nobody in Detroit, was doing anything like this. There were plenty of big cars, but most of them were boxy and square, and uh, they, what we call fill out the cube type designs, but nothing that sleek. This was trim and plan view when you looked down at the car. It had a lot of plan view in the front and the rear of the car, and the wheels. Uh, were out more to the extremities than we'd ever had before on any of these cars. So it had a strong influence on the total design uh, design uh, in the U.S. and on the, the automotive scene. But before we introduced the 79 Mustang, Arrow was considered a four-letter word because of the 1937 Chrysler Airflow. You remember that beauty? I think it was referred to as, in, in Detroit anyway, as fugly. <laughs> now, the interesting part about this car is that the Lincoln Zephyr in the same time frame was even more aerodynamic than the Chrysler Airflow, but they never advertised it because the Airflow had such a negative connotation. So we just kept our, I wasn't there at the time, I my dad, but we, uh, we just didn't talk about aerodynamics in those days. However, after the Mustang, we talked a lot about it. So the Mustang, 79 Mustang, really created uh, an all-new paradigm shift for Ford's management appreciation of functional design. And it led to the genesis of Ford's new aero direction. Now, its success paved the way for the uh, 1983 Thunderbird to see in red up there, which was people were starting to say, hey, now that's really getting aero. And, of course, the 1986 Taurus. By that time, we really reached, reached the maximum in aero and got just about everything we wanted. And for a very good reason, too. Uh, a number of our engineers, I think Lou Veraldi was one of the, the ones who was the chief engineer on the program, uh, was uh, with our European operations, and he understood what we were trying to achieve with this car. Everything from flush glass to the wheels out there, the sloping hood, the aero front end. And I just gotta tell you one story, I'm not here to talk about Taurus, but just one brief story. Uh, when this car, before this car was approved, our sales and marketing people said, well, wait a minute, you can't sell a car without a grill. So in the final review, we actually had to put a grill texture on the front of the Taurus. And I remember we called in the management team, and the head of the design committee at that time was uh, Bill Ford Sr., who just passed away recently, by the way, who was a real supporter of design. And the, the decision was up to Bill. And I, I'll still remember all the the management team sitting there looking at the car, one with the grill and one with just the floating oval on the front end of the car. And we all looked at Bill Ford and I was holding my breath and Bill Ford said, that's the one. I could have run up and kissed him. I mean, it was, that, it was that exciting. It was written up in Automotive News lately. They said I could have thrown my arms around him. I really said I could have kissed him, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, we, so the car obviously worked out. Now I'd like to show you uh, a picture of the team that designed the uh, Mustang Indianapolis pace car. That's uh, me. I used to have dark hair back then, believe it or not. And uh, the other guys in the Montford Lampy right up on the front, he was one of our designers from Germany who helped us design the car. But it was, uh, it was an exciting time, it really was. And incidentally, 11,000 of those vehicles were built, uh, 11,000 editions of the Indianapolis Mustang. And I'll never forget the thrill of uh, riding in that car, the real car at Indianapolis. It was an exciting time, exciting year, and we were the pace car, obviously, that year. And it was really the culmination of all of our efforts to get this car on the road. Now, the 79 Mustang was one of the most exciting 
and rewarding programs that I helped develop in my whole career at Ford. And it's been a pleasure to be here talking to you Mustang enthusiasts about this and sharing our common interest and the passion for these cars. Now, as you know, Mustang is known and it's aspired to all over the world. And I know there are people here from all over the world today, which I find uh, really interesting. Uh, I, I have to tell you one thing, when, how, how important this car was and how many people knew this car around the world. Uh, I was based in Australia for four years and there were a few Mustangs down there. That would have been in, oh, uh, 1966 or so when I was in Australia. Uh, but the Mustangs that were in Australia were all right-hand drive conversions. They were what they call the gray market cars. And people would bring them in and, and it was really special and expensive to have a Mustang in those other countries. But the Australians were so much in love with Mustang, even though we were just a few on the road, that uh, when we did uh, the, the car that we were really building in Australia, for Ford Australia, was the Falcon. It was just like the U.S. Falcon. And when we did facelifts on it in 1969, it's called the uh, XW Falcon, we actually put a Mustang mouth on the front of the Falcon car, built it into the grill, the opening of the grill. And our advertising theme that year was there's more Mustang and Falcon this year. And it worked. People really loved the car and our sales went up. GM was the number one seller in Australia for years. We couldn't touch them. And just by putting that Mustang front end on the front of a Falcon, zoom, our sales just shot right off the truck. It's the truth. I mean, I was there. I saw it happen myself. And we did a lot to improve the car, the ride and handling. The engineers had a lot to do with it, too. And but we really had our necks out on that one to get the car right. And now you know that the uh, The, uh, uh, the 2015 Mustang, uh, which is uh, becoming a very global car, will be available in both right and left hand drive, so it will be sold all around the world in Europe. And I, I can uh, I tell you, I remember when I was uh, in England, uh, one of our designers brought a 67 Mustang fastback over. He was over there on assignment for so he brought it. It was a silver fastback. I'll never forget it. And we were tooling around London in that car, and I can't, we felt like rock stars. You couldn't believe the people who would stop and stare at that car. As a matter of fact, we parked the car in front of the Hilton Hotel in Mayfair, and there were Mercedes and, and Jaguars and Maseratis and, and Bentleys and all sorts of cars around in front of the Hilton Hotel. We pulled up in that silver Mustang, and people just walked away from all those other cars and came up to the Mustang. And just, uh, I mean, it, it was amazing to see the reaction. But people know the car. They don't, you remember some, I'm sure all of you remember some of the movies about Mustang. One of the first ones I saw was in Australia in 1966. It was made in France. It was called A Man and a Woman. I don't know if any of you ever saw that. No, it was a love story. I, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention to love. I paid attention to the Mustang. It was riding around in Paris and all that. And the French never forgot that. I just know when this car comes out that it, it will, when it, it, with right and left hand drive, being sold all over the world, you know, we're going to sell that in Europe, in China, Australia, the whole Asia Pacific area. People know the car. I'll bet they're waiting for it. I tell you, our plan in Flat Rock, where we'll be building this car, it will be just full up. We won't be able to build them fast enough, guaranteed. So I want you. To, I want to say, just enjoy the ride of the new Mustangs, and enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the Mustangs' international future. All I can say is, Viva the Mustang! Thank you. Okay, now Jack, I know we're going to get a couple of questions, but I bet you there's going to be a lot of autograph seekers, and I know you have a plane to catch. So okay. we'll take just a couple of questions, Great. and then we'll make a line. Okay, we got a couple right up here. Young lady, you were first. Uh, oh. How long did the entire design process take from the time you came back to the U.S. to the time you were successful in getting the car back Okay, well, yeah, well uh, we started, uh, let's see, in 76, about mid-76, and the car was on the road by... Uh, what, the fall of 79, so the entire process. Of course, when you say the entire design press, uh, us designers are the kind of guys that are making changes on the car as it's running down the production line. You know, we took the manufacturing guys were always trying to kick us out of the plants, but it was, that was the time frame, generally, yeah. Can I go right there? Yes. Of the plane. Right. Well, I've heard a lot of stories about that. I understand, I, I can't uh, document this, but I understand it was the plane. 
Well, well John, the, the, not John the Jar, who did Mustang One, wanted it named after the plane. Yep. And, then, and then, of course, when they said, no, the, the horse is more familiar, uh, the war thing is not exactly a great marketing tool, they used it on the horse. But for the real Mustang, it was never a debate. It was always going to be after the horse. They wanted Cougar, and then they got the horse from, yep. from research. From the, from the horse, definitely one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Horse yeah. Thank like God it did because it just said uh, the, the connotation of the horse is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? That uh, seat pillar or sail panel back there on, on the box, it's pretty large. It's divided into two. Is that our styling or engineering or why is it so? Yeah, you're starting, and it has the louvers up the front of the seat pillar? Yeah. Yeah. But we wanted, it's a pretty wide seat pillar, and we just visually wanted to break it up a bit and give it a more close couple coupe effect, both on the notchback and the fastback. So that was one of our design uh, ideas to, I just gonna say tricks, it's not a trick, but it was, it was just a design feature. We really tried to thin it up a bit visually. Come on right here. It, it, some people said it had a touch of Mercedes walking around in there. Okay, it did. Jack, could you talk a little bit about the transition to the arrow nose of the Fox in 1987 and how that came about and, and what the mission was? Yeah, in uh, in seventy nine, you mean? No, no, in, in in when the rounded nose in 1987. Later on, when it, yeah. oh, oh, okay, yeah, yes. right, yeah, yeah. But I wasn't involved in all of those programs because right. then I was sure, all sure. in other places. But yeah. there were uh, it, it was a matter of uh, getting more differential and uh, to freshen up the car. They really just wanted to try some different effects on it, and but they still maintain the same arrow, good arrow numbers in the car. Even we were just getting smarter and smarter with arrow. Yeah. Of course, putting spoilers and air dams and all that sort of thing in the right. car, yeah. but it, uh, we had it. We had to maintain the air on it. Folks, we want Jack to be able to catch his plane, and we want you to get a chance to get an autograph from Jack. So, Jack, if you will come back, maybe to Michigan when we do uh, the Mustang Memory Show right after the Woodward Dream Cruise, and people can ask you questions again there. But, right. ladies and gentlemen, Jack flew in just for this moment to be with you, and going back home, please give him a round of applause.